Shall we now turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 23? Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 23. And we shall read verse 8. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 8. Onward. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even that is only Christ, and all ye are brethren. And either be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. The title this morning is, morning is Death of a Guru. Death of a Guru. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is telling not only to his disciples, but to all. Matthew chapter 23 begins with these words. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. So Jesus spoke to the multitudes, everyone, all the people that were gathered there, many people, and also to his disciples. The instruction that Jesus was giving at this time was about the scribes and the Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Moses was a teacher appointed by God. He was not a teacher unto himself. He was not a self-made teacher. He, in fact, did not want to serve God. He was too afraid. He believed that he was not fit for such a work when God called him. He told God to find someone else. Find someone else. It's not for me. Let us listen to the words he spoke to God. We find this in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. My tongue is heavy. I cannot speak fluently, eloquently. And in verse 13 he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Send someone else. There are many other people who are much better than me. I'm not fit for it. Send someone else. But God would not leave him. He would not leave him. And so he established him as a master, as a teacher, a guru. And Moses was a very humble man. God gave him the laws, and Moses taught these laws to the people of Israel. Now, subsequently, going further, centuries ahead, many men became the teachers of Moses' laws, and they began to teach people. They became learned men. They learned the law and interpreted it to the people. What common people could not understand, they made them understand. And these men became guides to the people. And many people followed them. People were always in search for such teachers. They tried to follow the best teacher in town and in the city. Wherever there were Jews, there were these teachers, and some had large following. We follow people on 
Instagram and, and whatever, YouTube and, you know, on the internet. People are always following people. And the trend of following teachers or masters was not common only to Israel, but to all nations, to all nations. In India, we call teachers or masters gurus, gurus. The cult of teachers or gurus was prevalent in Babylon, in Persia, in Greece, in Rome, in Europe, in China, and it is present even today. There is a tendency in men, deep-seated tendency, to follow after the exalted flesh. There is a tendency in men to associate themselves with what can be seen with the eyes. We humans like to be linked with the greatest. We like to cling to that which is praised and admired and that which is followed by many. We want to be in that number. You will remember that such was the case in the church of Corinth. The Christians in Corinth were divided. They were followers of gurus. Some followed Paul, others followed Apollos, yet others followed Peter. Apostle Paul called them carnal. Carnal. He said to them that there is envying and strife and division among you. Obviously, isn't it? When you get into groups and cliques to follow certain leaders, there be division. You walk like the rest of the world, he said, and not like the children of God. Who are we? He said, we are nothing. We only give back what God has given to us. And then he told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men. No man glory in men. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul said, look to Jesus. Look to him. Follow him. Be taught by Jesus. He alone is the exalted teacher. The people in Israel used the term rabbi or master to those that taught religion. Rabbi meant my great one, my honorable sir. And this was a title used by the Jews to address their teachers. They used the same term when they were not addressing them directly. They highly esteemed these teachers, these gurus. And beside using the title rabbi, they also used master as the title. This meant a guide, a person who is a guide. But masters also retained the title of teacher. So master or guru was their guide. They took him as their guide to lead them, to teach them and direct them in their life journey. When these people encountered trouble and difficulties in their day-to-day -day life, they went to their master. Their gurus instructed them from the scriptures and from their own knowledge. However, as time went by, these Jewish masters, rabbis, many of them added their own teachings. Their own teaching. They added their own ideas about God, about morality, about life and life after death. They added their own thinking about how to go to heaven, how to please God, how to escape punishment, how to become rich, how to gain power, how to become successful, how to destroy your enemies. And as time went by, these masters, these gurus began to seek for their own interest. They became self-centered, they began to be interested in riches and power for themselves. So much so, they did not teach the word of God anymore, but their 
theology, their philosophy and ideology. They thought their own pet subject and this was for their own gain. And this is what happened and happens to people. And this is what happened to the church. The Roman Catholic Church, they produced so much literature from their own heads that people were fed only with that and the Bible, the Word of God remained down and their own interpretation and own theology and their own scripture and whatever piled higher and higher and higher. Actually, for half a century now, Christian teachers, by and large, have taken upon themselves to act like the gurus, like India or like the olden days. Like the gurus of other religions, the gurus of Christianity have large following. Large following. Like the gurus of other religions, the gurus of Christianity own mansions and luxury cars and even jets to take them from one place to the other. They live entirely a different lifestyle from the lifestyle of our Savior Jesus Christ. Actually, they have a large following because those that follow these teachers, their interest matches up with the interests of their teachers. They also want to become like them, successful, rich, and learn to get more from God, whatever they ask. Obviously, if the one who stands on the pulpit shows off his watch, gold watch, or shows his shoes, uh, most expensive shoes, and whatever, and they know that he is having a big bungalow, whatever, oh, they would like to be like him, because he's showing, guiding people the way of how to become rich like him. But they don't know that he's becoming rich from your money. When you make a certain teacher or a guru your guide, in principle, in principle, you must stop thinking. You must do whatever the guru asks you to do. You must worship him. You must once a week fast and pray to this guru and surrender your life to this guru. In this way, your soul is tied to his spirit and whatever spirit he possesses. If you come to India and you talk to people, you will, they, as they are talking with you and you offer them something, oh no, they say, it is my guru's day, I am I, fasting today. And some of them have two or three gurus. They literally stop eating. These gurus and masters never question their people about their moral life. They never question their people about their sinful behavior. They do not instruct their followers how to overcome sin and grow in sanctification. They do not inform them as to how sin and suffering came into the world. There is no guidance as to how to get rid of sinful nature and how to go to heaven. It is all about how to become successful. It is about how to find healing for their illnesses. It is all about magic and wonder. It is about marvel and wizardry. It is about mantras and chants to keep you safe and secure. It is about amulets and rings and rosary-like chains round the neck and pictures and ashes to apply and put on your body. These artifacts of these or these relics like charms they say they, they will keep you they keep keep you protected from your enemies and the spells of your enemies and this is the reason why true christians do not wear a cross on them jesus said they will know that you are my disciples by your deeds not by what you wear they will know you by your fruits. 
Now, just as there are thousands upon thousands of teachers or gurus today, similarly, there are many teachers and masters or gurus that were during the time of Jesus Christ. There were many of them. What had Jesus to say about them? He told a multitude of people and he told his disciples, do not be like them. Do not be like them. A terrible rebuke, isn't it? Why? Because they do not do what they ask you to do. Whatever good things they tell you to do, you obey them. But don't be like them. They don't practice what they preach. Matthew 23 verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not e after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, you become better than your teachers. You become better than your teachers. You should become more righteous. Your righteousness should exceed more than the Pharisees, Jesus said. The next thing that the Lord Jesus Christ tells the multitude and the disciples is that they put heavy burdens upon their followers. They ask them to observe this day as a holy day and that day as a fast day and they will tell their disciples, don't eat this and don't eat that. They will charge them money and ask for donations. They will tell their disciples, don't wear this and don't wear that. They will tell them to go for a pilgrimage to some place and offer blood of an animal or shave off your head and offer that hair or you cut off yourself and spill that blood on uh, to offer it for that deity. So many burdens they lay upon their followers. Jesus says, but they themselves will not move to help enlighten the burden from their followers. This is on verse 4. Then the Lord Jesus Christ goes to say that whatever they do, they do it so that all the people will see what they are doing. They even dress differently. They exaggerate their clothing to make it look holier than thou. I am holy than thou. Look at verse 5. Everything they do is for show. For show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. Tassels are something like this. So they wear longer ones. Jesus said this is the Jew Jesus said this in the Jewish context. But look at our priest, our bishops, the Pope, Archbishop. Our gurus, or sannyasis, our monks, and so-called holy men, they wear different clothing to give themselves an aura of speciality. They do this to show to the world that they are expert in this field of religion and that all must respect them and bow before them. They count it on their garments. The other thing they love, Jesus says, is that they love the uppermost places at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and they love to be greeted in the markets and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Let us read uh, verse 6 and 7. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. Verse 7, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. The Lord Jesus Christ makes us understand why they wear things differently. We can now understand why they exaggerate their costumes. This is to gain attention. This is to make people believe that they are different. They are not same like the rest of the common people. 
The message they send is, you are unholy, I am holy. You are sinners, I am not a sinner. You belong to the devil, I belong to God. You need me. I and the like of us must be respected, given the first place at feast, dramas, and must be placed on the chief seat above all people. They want to stand apart from the rest. They want us to depend on them. This is the reason why, when the Reformation began, the Reformation which came from God, turning the hearts of men to the Word of God, the Bible, the outward look of the servants of the Lord underwent a drastic change. They stopped wearing cassocks and special garments with bright colors and kingly sort of, you know, uh, gowns. These, after the Reformation, when they came to Christ, they wore what rest of the people wore. They identified themselves with the rest of the people. In verse 8, there is a sudden twist in what Jesus says. He says to the multitude of people and to his disciples, Be, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. There is only one who is your master, only one, Christ says Jesus. And by saying this, Jesus brought death to the concept and practice that was practiced among the rabbis and the teachers and the gurus that had been held so far. Whatever image they were giving, whatever feelings they had, whatever th belief they had about themselves came crushing down. The Lord Jesus Christ brought death to this idea. Do not be called rabbi, teacher or guru. Jesus repeats this again in verse 10. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even only Christ. By saying what Jesus said, he was saying, there are no teachers, no masters, no rabbis, no gurus. The only person who can be called rabbi, teacher, master, the guide, the guru is Christ and Christ alone. Jesus claims that he alone and no one else is the teacher, the master, the guide. The rabbi. This means Jesus brought death to the rest of the teachers on this earth. He put them to extinction. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, claimed that he alone is the teacher, the master, the guru. If there is only one truth, then there must be only one teacher that teaches the absolute truth. The Lord Jesus says, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth must come from only one teacher. Jesus, by saying this, declared death on rest of the teachers. By this, Jesus does not mean that the rest of the teachers must die or to, or, or to be killed. No. By this, Jesus means all teachers, all gurus, all rabbis must submit to Christ Jesus. All teachers, all gurus must learn from Jesus Christ. Only Jesus has the ability, only Jesus has the knowledge, only Jesus has the whole truth and wisdom. Only Jesus Christ has the everlasting knowledge and wisdom. Whether you agree or not, it does not make any difference. Truth prevails. 
Why is Jesus the only truth? This is so because he is not of this earth. He is from above. He is from the beginning. By him and through him all things were created. All those that claim to be teachers, rabbis, gurus are created by him. They cannot be better than Jesus. They are of the earth. They cannot have enlightenment by themselves, sitting under the tree or going into the desert or sitting on the high mountain top. No, it cannot come from within. It has to come from the one who is the light. That is Christ Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Enlightenment can come only through Jesus Christ. Only that which he speaks and teaches is the truth. If any person is not in Christ, he is dead. He is darkness. There is no light in him. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. If anyone is not in Christ, not enlightened by Christ, does not have the knowledge that Jesus Christ gives, let him be anathema. What does it mean to be anathema? It means to be cursed. To be cursed means that you will end up in hell. You will be annihilated forever. If you do not love Christ the teacher, the master, the guru, you will not enter into eternal life. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. He that is not with me is against me. Not only that, but Jesus pointing to himself actually says in John chapter 6, and listen to this carefully, John chapter 6, verse 50 onward, and the whole chapter for that matter, but we take only this portion for our understanding. He said, pointing to himself, this is the bread which came down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. What is this bread that Jesus is talking about? What is this drinking of his blood and eating of his flesh that Jesus is talking about? Well, going down to verse 63, Jesus goes to explain what this body and blood is, what this living bread is. He says in verse 63, John chapter 6, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, which words? All that he has said about eating his bread, uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, about him being the bread of life, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Eating flesh or drinking blood does not profit anything, he says. It is the spirit, the spirit. What is the spirit? His word. The sword of the Holy Spirit, what is it? The Word. The Word. That is life. That is life. 
Did not Jesus say that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the only true master, guide, guru, and rabbi because his words are life-giving. His words are spirit. He is God and his words are proceeding from the mouth of God. They give life, they are eternal, they are truth. They are like the bread which you and I can feed upon. Therefore, we must hold the word of God so close, dear friends. You will not fear when you have the word of God in you, Christ himself in you. No other teacher, master, guru, rabbi can produce words of life and eternity. None. None have said, Muhammad, his words have given me life. Or Gautam Buddha has given me life. Or Guru Nanak has given me life. My sins have been forgiven. I am transformed. No one has said that, dear friends. And we are saying it only because this has happened to us. What Jesus says has happened. I didn't say that before for 35 years. I could not say because it has not happened. I didn't know about it. I knew it in my mind. I read it, but it did not change me. But Christ can change and deliver you by his word. Only Jesus can and has the truth. If you are not with Christ Jesus, then you are his enemy. This means if at all you want to be a guru, teacher, a rabbi, then only thing you can do is learn what Jesus has taught. Then you will be an authentic teacher because you are following and teaching what the authentic teacher has taught. If you want to be a teacher, a rabbi, a guru, then you must teach what Jesus has taught. You want to guide people to the truth, to eternal life, then you must only teach and guide what Jesus has instructed about life, death, and life after death. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other absolute truth. Apostle Paul clearly says, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, he says, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed accursed. These are terrible words, dear friends. Serious. But we must take it seriously too. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? You see, that's a problem. Earthly gurus and teachers, they are interested in only pleasing men. So Paul here, who is a follower of Christ, who has been redeemed by him, saved by him, given eternal life, now he's instructing people what Jesus has instructed him. He says, do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. No, I'm disqualified to be a teacher. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? The gospel is the teachings of God. The gospel is the teachings of the only teacher, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In this gospel is a forgiveness of sins. In this gospel is a way of eternal life. In this gospel is a life everlasting. In this gospel is the truth. Therefore, Jesus says, God so loved the world. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not be destroyed, but have eternal life. Teachers, gurus, masters, priests, bishops, popes, archbishops, mullahs, those that call themselves so, they must humble themselves. And so must all the pastors and teachers who teach their own things. They must humble themselves, unlearn what has been learned, strip off the wisdom of our own understanding of the world, die to ourselves and come under the teaching of that one teacher of truth, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is not the teacher from this earth, but from heaven. He alone is risen from the dead and has destroyed the power of the grave. He is now seated in heaven. He alone is a fountain of eternal knowledge. He alone is the eternal word of God. He is the word. The guru in us who is limited, shaky, weak, hardly truthful, mixed with truth and lies, self-centered, driven with selfish gain, must die. The guru in us, the teacher in us, with all human knowledge and imagination, must die. This fleshly guru in you and me must die. This carnal-minded, worldly, impure, lying, cheating, hypocritical guru, teacher, money-hungry guru, driven by lust, this guru, this teacher must die. Those that want to be true teachers, masters, gurus must become servants, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the perfect master, became our servant. He became our servant. He says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 11, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus stooped even so low to wash the feet of his disciples. What humility! Now, you may think that Jesus directed this only towards the religious teachers and gurus. But remember, Jesus spoke to the multitudes of people and to his disciples. There are many of us who think that we are better than our teachers. And we are better teachers than God and Jesus Christ himself. I met a woman in Watford on Thursday. And while speaking, a wonderful person, honest in a way that she is honest. And while speaking to her about the Lord Jesus Christ, she said, I believe in the Bible, but I believe in myself, and I know better. I can teach myself better to live a life of love. I'm not a sinner. Perhaps you are like this woman. We all have this kind of tendency, as I said in the beginning. I had a, definitely had the same mind like this woman. There is no doubt about it. My friends believed and would think in the same way. We are full of pride. We are foolish. Finally, let us hear what the Bible has to say about those that will not come under the only true teacher and obey not his teaching. What does Jesus say? He will cast them out. He will cast them out. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Cast them out in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished 
with everlasting destruction from the uh, and shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You didn't want Christ to teach you? You wanted to go your own way? You wanted to be separated from him? Okay, have your way. Go into the lake of fire, separated from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Dear friends, to come to the feet of the true and righteous teacher, the Guru, you and I must die. We must die to our own thinking. Yes, strip ourselves of that old ways of thinking, the carnal ways, our imaginations. There must be the death of a Guru, that the living Guru may come and live in you. You must decrease so that Christ increase in you. Shall we pray?